John writes in to ask, Greetings, Mr. McLunduk. Greetings, Mr. McJohn. For all of our talk of open source and future proofing, we Linux users have a dirty little secret. Our old software doesn't run on new distros. Try downloading a program. He spells program with an E at the end. That's adorable. A program from the 2000s or late 90s, and you have little chance of being able to run it. This is totally true. Because the dependencies just won't let you. And it's probably long gone from repositories. Maybe, maybe, if you spend the day compiling old source tarballs, you might get it working. But that's assuming those tarballs are still around. I'm ashamed to say that I usually get the Windows EXE file and run it under Wine. Ooh, man, that's McJohn. That's a hard, hard pill to swallow. It usually works immediately. But what can be done to make our distros more backwards compatible? Snuggles, John. John, first of all, thank you for the snuggles. Second of all, you make a really good point, my friend. It's amazing how bad our backwards compatibility is in the open sourcey, free software world. If you pick up Linux software, right? Let's say he's right. Stuff from just like, let's say, 15 years ago. The chance of getting it to run now is really small like really really small and we're not just talking about changes between cpu architectures like let's say a jump from 32 to 64 bit the remaining uh dependencies are 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 all either gone or changed so dramatically that it just won't run or and good luck getting it to compile from source that's going to be a minor nightmare it is truly truly difficult to pull that off we we just we just don't do a good job. A lot of a lot of great examples for this are in the early commercial Linux games. Like a lot of the ports, uh, like that Loki games did, like Railroad Tycoon Two and the like, where they ported things over to Linux, getting them to run on modern day Linux distros, even though that was what a decade ago, uh, is hard. <laughs> I mean, really really hard it is it is abysmally difficult and it is a massive problem and what makes this even worse is the operating systems themselves often have a very limited shelf life of how long you can reasonably actually use them and it's not we're not talking about support here like i can call someone and get support or there's going to get like let's say new patches we're talking about the fact that our operating systems our linux distributions are fundamentally tied to the software repositories that we build and that 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 design has so many benefits but the drawback is as soon as that server goes down getting new software for that version of that distribution is almost impossible case in point ubuntu has only been around since um um when, when did ubuntu come out 2006 2006, is that right? So that's what, uh, 13 years, something like that? Thereabouts. I, I might be a couple years off either way. Go grab the first couple versions of Ubuntu. Install them on hardware that would have been supported back then or in a virtual machine. And then notice how quickly everything breaks and explodes because it can't hit the repositories because they just don't exist anymore. And for good reason. I mean, a lot of older systems simply don't have the user base or uh, or the 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 financial incentives for any company to keep them going. Sometimes you'll find people who will take a about to be discontinued distro and they will clone the entire repository and set that up somewhere else. So it is theoretically possible to try and keep that cludging along. But even then, I mean, it's it's hard. And if you are just a, a person who is like, I'm going to put on my version of a, a Ubuntu 604, whatever that was, Warty Warthog. I can't, I can't remember which version was which animal with an adjective anymore. But if you, you try and do that, it does break spectacularly. And the same holds true for, for many, many distributions. It's not meaning to pick on Ubuntu there. It's, it's a real significant problem, a real big problem. And in my mind, it's kind of it's kind of crummy. Now, there are ways around fixing that, but 
they don't really have a whole lot of adoption. Like we could do app images and app images. If you don't know what those are, it's basically an ISO file, um, like a, like a CD ROM image, right? A dot ISO file that contains the application itself, plus all of the dependencies for that application. Uh, so in theory, in theory, you could put that on any distribution, uh, of a certain Linux kernel version um, with certain very, very base dependencies or higher, and it would still be able to run. That makes the situation much, much better. But that's only really been around for you know the last couple of years and still hasn't gained total widespread adoption. So the applications that are distributed nowadays in various repositories not only take a ton of resources to to build and package for a ton of different distributions, but you really only have a shelf life of those functioning for a handful of years. It's a, it's a technical problem and it's a resource allocation problem. How do you keep it, things going when you are trying to support 5, 10, 15, 20 plus year old software in the software world, in the open source world that is ancient? but it's still important to be able to do. Like I said, like if you, I've picked up uh, many Linux commercial titles over the years. I use Railroad Tycoon too because I, I literally was just thinking the other day, I love the game Railroad Tycoon 2 because I love trains and I like to play with them. And that was one of my favorite versions of that, of that series. And I bought the Linux version of that game. And last I tried, I was unable to get it to run under any Linux system that I have. And that's that includes uh, multiple computers, including a 32-bit laptop. Uh, so I'm not, most of my machines are all 64-bit, but I do have one 32-bit laptop. And uh, even on that machine, running a kind of older version of Debian for the 2019 era, I still wasn't able to get that game running. And I, I want to say that game maybe came out in I want to guess like 2008. I, I don't know. I could be off on that one. It, it, maybe 2007. I don't know. Something like that. It was was over a decade ago to be sure. And it is disappointing when you can't do that. When you can't get a, a game or an application that you relied on to run on modern computers that are running ostensibly a, just a newer version of the same operating system, that is disappointing. We don't have that backwards compatibility like, like we should, I feel like. And... You know, Windows and Mac aren't great about it either. Windows is better about it than than the rest of them. Uh, Mac backwards compatibility is pretty atrocious. I mean, run it, run a run a piece of software from Mac OS nine under the current version of Mac OS ten. Yeah, good good luck with that, buddy. Um, and that you know we're talking about the same kind of time period here. Um, want to heck want to run something from an early version of Mac OS ten on a later version of Mac OS ten? Uh, it might run maybe. I mean, even if it was compiled for the same CPU architecture, which, you know, Macs jump between CPU architectures from time to time, uh, you still, there's so many libraries and dependencies and application kits and whatnot that have changed in the Mac side that getting them running is just, you're really reliant on software being continually updated. And I think that's part of the big bummer here is that I view software and games, basically any type, any type of piece of software, whether it's productivity or for fun or whatnot, as kind of a thing that's beautiful, you know, a, a, a work of both art and engineering that should be preserved and should be able to be looked back on and run, not just because we could get some use out of it, but because it's interesting to see what things were like. And it's valuable to do that. And the fact that it's harder and harder to do that as the years go on is, I think, is terribly frightening. Increasing amounts of software have reliance on online resources. Increasing amounts of software um, have a growing number of dependencies of external libraries or command line applications or whatnot that they rely upon. And as that goes forward things break more. And that sucks. I hate that. I hate that a ton. And it is. It's a dirty little secret, McJohn. Uh, and you're right. It is sometimes just easier to use Wine and go grab a Windows version of an application than to find a Linux version of an application on Linux. That is absolutely true. Um, not always, but many times. And that is kind of a bummer. I, I would love to see a renewed effort on keeping things 
backwards compatible. I, I think it's important. Uh, I think it's profoundly important. And I know many people will disagree with me on this. They, you know, get rid of the old stuff onward and upward. Let's focus on new things. Uh, let's only support things for a couple of years. I, I know many people think that way. And, and you know what? It's a valid point of view. There's really good reasons to, to shuff off the old code and, and move forward. Many good reasons. But on the same token, old stuff isn't necessarily worse. In fact, oftentimes old stuff is better. Um, word processing. Just as an example. There are older versions of word processors like Abbey Word and, and LibreOffice that I like better than the newer versions, but I can't get to run nowadays without building myself into some sort of dependency hell on my system. Um, web browsers. I like older web browsers a lot more than newer web browsers, a ton more. They're faster, they're leaner, they're sleeker, they get in your way less. I just prefer them. I mean, yeah, they have less features and, and yeah, most of them have been out of like, let's say I want to use, <laughs> let's say I want to use early versions of Firefox. Early versions of Firefox were awesome. Awesome. I love early versions of Firefox. They were fast. Well, they had a couple of buggy versions in there, but, but there was a couple of early versions that were just awesome and fast and stable and great. It, it, you know, it's just, it, they were just amazing. I love them so much more than current Firefox or Chrome. Or, or any of the derivative browsers that I've used lately. And uh, getting those to run is a mild nightmare. Uh, again, it's possible to do using app images and whatnot, but it is a lot of work and not a lot of people are doing it and it still has its own challenges. So yeah, John, you are absolutely right. It is our dirty little secret. Backwards compatibility stinks in the Linux world. It stinks. <coughs> it's just the worst. But, I mean, at least we get new builds sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. There's not really a great solution to it because the reality is, in order to maintain backwards compatibility, we have to say that that's a priority for us. And we have to put significant not only engineering but testing resources into doing it, which means uh, locking down API and ABI uh, freezes and saying we're not going to change this. This API is, is as it was and it will never change. And there's good and there's bad that comes with that. And as a general open source community, we've kind of decided most of the time that, you know, every couple of years, we're okay with breaking that compatibility. And we're okay with stopping supporting our old repositories and just letting them go offline. Uh, we've just decided we're okay with that. And that, that's kind of sad. That's kind of sad to me. I would love to see um, a resurgence of people supporting and maintaining old systems, you know, like, like SUSE Linux six or, you know, Red Hat three, like pre Fedora stuff or early versions of Slackware and just say, you know what, we're just going to keep supporting this. <laughs> we're just going to keep this running. <laughs> I mean, there's the, the total amount of people actually using that would be just astronomically small, but I think it'd be cool and worthwhile. I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing to ponder on, John. It, it really is. Uh, I would would love to, excuse me, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that as I burp into the microphone. Heavens to Betsy Lunduke, what are you doing? Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good solution because we don't have the resources to pull it off. Microsoft has tons of resources dedicated to backwards compatibility and they still fail with great regularity but they do better than us in that, in that way. And that kind of stings a little bit. Um, this episode of the Lunduk show is brought to you by, by Lulz bot 3d printers. If you go to lulzbot.com, big 3d printers, slightly smaller 3d printers. You can get the Taz six or the mini and they're gorgeous 3d printers. They're amazing. Uh, replaceable nozzles with different types of nozzles, including dual extruder nozzles and, and extra fine micro accuracy nozzles and, you get all sorts of different filaments to go with it, including stuff that's kind of rubbery, stuff that's kind of woody. Seriously, there's particles of wood in it, uh, stuff that has iron in it, so you can make it, so you can put magnets on it. You can do so many different things with those 3D printers. They're just awesome. A uh, home's not a home without a 3D printer. You can get them over at lulzbot.com. By the way, lulzbot, lulzbot loves the open source and the free software. 
That's what they're all about. And uh, go on over to Lunduke.com. Go to Patreon.com slash Lunduke. Go to YouTube.com slash Brian Lunduke. There's lots of ways to get the Lunduke show. There's lots of ways to support the show. And uh, whichever one you choose, it's delightful. You can also go over to LinuxJournal.com and read the articles I write over there. It's truly fantastic. All right. I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go have a donut. That's what I'm going to do. I've decided that I've earned a donut today, and today I shall eat a donut. I hope you have a donut, too. See you later.